Image family. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord? I love to welcome everyone watching online. Thank you for joining us this morning. Let's all just close our eyes. Let's lift our hearts and gaze upon Jesus. This morning as I was praying, I just felt the Lord's jealousy to come and be with us, that he has given us his one and only son. He's given us his only begotten son because he loved us. And he is longing for our hearts and we get to gladly respond to his love, gladly respond to his sacrifice of his son. I'm gonna read from Psalm 100. It says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. So Jesus, we thank you for the honor it is to come into your presence and worship you, Jesus. You are so worthy of our love, Lord. You're worthy of our lives, Jesus. So we come before you with thankful hearts, Jesus, not just lips that say a God, but a heart that is truly grateful for giving us your one and only son. So we thank you this morning. We give you this day in Jesus' name.
through every loss or victory my soul will rise to only bring you glory with every breath that's in my lungs my heart cries out to you belongs the glory So will rise to only bring you glory. With every breath that's in my lungs, my heart cries out to you belongs the glory. With every loss or pain.
every voice now.
Can we take the next few moments and just sing in the spirit all over the house? Come on, all over the house. please would you just join hands just not across the aisles thank you Lord let's just close our eyes and give the Lord all of our attention all of our attention holy wonderful father we declare this morning as the body of Jesus that you are holy Let's put that on our lips, church. You are holy. You are holy, Father. We come, Lord, not in our own strength or merit, but we come by the blood of Jesus this morning. And we do plead the blood as one family. We apply the blood by faith, by the hyssop, the hyssop of faith, Lord. We apply the blood, and your word says, Thou hast cleansed me with hyssop. Cleanse our minds this morning. Cleanse our hearts. Cleanse our motives, our hands, our feet. Sanctify our ears, our vision, that we would see and hear the Lord. And we ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to have your way. To have your way in us, through us, Lord, in this house, in our families. Have your way. Have your perfect trustworthy majestic way and show us the beauty this morning of Christ crucified and we pray for that person Lord on each side of us just begin interceding for them out loud guys out loud and I want you just to begin praying wonderful things over them go ahead pray great and mighty things over them Holy, holy. Keep praying out loud. Pray that God's perfect, wonderful will be done in their life. Holy, holy, holy. Thank you, Lord. Keep praying. Pray for their families. Pray for the generations to come. Pray for their marriages, their children, their destinies. We give you all the glory. Keep praying just a little more. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can let go of that hand next to you. Let's just lift our hands once more. Can we just say this in faith? Come, Holy Spirit. Say that again. Come, Holy Spirit. One more time. Yes, Lord. And reveal Jesus to our hearts. Amen. Amen. Can we seal that with praise this morning? Come on. Give you all the glory. All the glory.
that felt too good to not do again. Come on, give the Lord glory. Give you all the glory. All the glory. All the glory. All the glory. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Can we please thank the worship team for leading us into the presence of the Lord? Jess. You guys can all go back to your seats. Good morning. Thank you, Daniel. How are you guys? Good, good. Someone's awake. I love it. Uh, before we get into, can we let our choir know how much we love them too? They're the best. Absolute best. Oh man. Um, before we get into tithe and offering, we are aware that our church is growing. We are so blessed by that. Um, I think we had our Connect class two weeks ago and it was the largest turnout we've ever had to date. And I say all this um, letting you know that we really want you guys to connect with one another. So we are offering more small group opportunities. And if you want to put that up right there, you can just scan the QR code. I don't know where David, oh, there, <laughs> right there. Okay. Um, how many small groups do we have now? 13. Um, and we have them in different regions and different areas of the city. So if you want to connect with one another and just go deeper, Join the small group. I really think they'll bless you. We have all kinds of options. Have we started the pickleball small group yet? Yeah? Okay. We're not responsible for any broken bones or if you guys are competitive. I think, Ryan, are you going to help lead that one? God bless you guys. I have a feeling that's going to be a very popular small group pickleball. All right. But with that being said, you can uh, scan that and this will give you a chance to connect deeper. And we just love what the Lord is doing with this church family, don't we? Amen. Okay. A few of you do. Do we love what the Lord is doing with this church family? All right. So let's get into tithe and offering. Go to Romans 11, 16. Romans eleven sixteen. It says, and since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their descendants will also be holy, just as the entire batch of dough is holy, because the portion giving, given as an offering is holy. Another version reads, first fruits. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. Well, you might say, Jess, what does this mean? Give Jesus your first fruit and your best because then everything else is blessed after that. So our finances, they all belong to God. They don't belong to us. He gave them to us first. But when we withhold that from him, then nothing else is blessed. This isn't just finances. This is the beginning of our mornings. This is the beginning. This is how we do family, how we do church, how we do everything. But I know a lot of people are eager to give God they're everything, but if the Lord can't trust you with your finances, he doesn't have all of your heart. Billy Graham used to say, I know a lot about a person just by looking in their checkbook. Now maybe it would be uh, your phone, whatever it is, but that shows a lot about where your heart is. If we hold on to things, we're saying, we don't trust you fully, the Lord. And tithing is just obedience. The Bible says in Malachi 3, you robbed me with your tithe and your offering because we have to give everything generously and lovingly to the Lord. And not only do we have to give because it's what he asks us to do, but he also wants us to be joyful givers. That means when we give, we don't give reluctantly or because we feel pressure. Please never give here if you feel pressure to do that. That's not the Lord, I don't ever want you to feel pressure. But we give because we get to. And it's an act of worship. It really is. We were reading, I was teaching a House of Bethany a few days ago, and we were reading about how when they worshiped the Lord, they brought in their offerings. It's all worship, my friends. So if you want God to bless you, just as we read here, you have to trust him 
with your everything. And if you don't, I would ask the Holy Spirit to help you trust him. He's such a good God. We trust to put our money in the bank, but we don't trust to give it to the hands of Jesus. So the Lord wants us to have this kind of obedience so that everything can be holy. Michael and I, we've told you this before, we, right when we get paid, it goes, tithe goes first. We don't even touch it. Because I want the Lord to bless us in our finances. And I know I have to give God my first fruits, as that one version just said. He gets it first. Then I know that everything else that we have will be blessed because we were obedient to God and gave him our very best first. This is a holy invitation for us, church. Let's bow our head and close our eyes. Dear Jesus, we love you. We bless you, Lord. Thank you, God, for all you've done. Lord, in our lives, with our children, Lord, with our marriages, Lord, with our families. Thank you what you've done here at this church, God. It's an honor that we even get to gather and worship you. We don't take anything for granted, Lord, big or small. We see you in every area of our life. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask that you will just speak right now, even to people, to their hearts, Lord. We want to be obedient in giving our tithe and offering, Lord. We don't want to withhold anything from you, Jesus. You gave us your entire life on the cross. It's our joy to give to you, Lord, and we want to give it gladly and joyfully. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. There's many ways to give if you're watching online. We love our online family so very much. There is a link on your screen. If you're in the house, there is a link on the screen as well for you. If you wanna give it by envelope, just raise your hands and keep them up. And one of our ushers will come and bring you an envelope and then you can come down and put it in the buckets. We'll be back in just a moment. Just a 
to be in the house of the Lord today. It's a beautiful Sunday morning because today we get to dedicate some babies to the Lord. It's one of the favorite things that we do. So why don't we go ahead and bring up, can we honor the families as they come up today? going to dedicate Lily and Esther first. <laughs> and I'm going to do, be doing the dedications in Spanish this morning, just as a prophetic act. No, I'm joking. It's not. I'm going to do it in English. <laughs> the All first right. family we have is the Izagira family, and they're dedicating the baby. Actually, can we stand for a moment? I feel this very strongly. Let's stretch our hands towards all of these precious families. Just begin praying in the Spirit. Father in heaven, we pray in Jesus' mighty name that this would not be a mere act, but that the wonderful Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, would come and descend upon these, these children and these families, and that a true blessing would be released yes. that would rest upon them forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise. First, we have the Izagira family, and they're dedicating their baby Amari to the Lord. Amari. How, how old is Amari? One. Oh, right, let's stretch our hands. Father, thank you for Amari. We thank you for this life that we dedicate unto you as your church. And Lord, may she walk in the fold of Christ all her days. May she never know a day outside of your glory and presence. We plead the blood over her, and may she be branded with the cross. Yes. We dedicate her unto the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Give the Lord praise. God bless you. Yeah. Next, we have the Alvarez family, and they're dedicating their babies, Lucas and Isabella, to the Lord. <laughs> oh, I already dedicated him. Did I? No. Oh, I thought I did already once. When did I see him? I've seen him before. Yeah. yeah. Last the week, where? Meeting. Oh, the new I'm members meeting. New members. I, you can't forget that. <laughs> that is amazing. I think the only head of hair I've seen like that is, is Judah. Yeah. Lily's son. That is amazing. I feel like we need to do something with that. I, I love his, I want his hair. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay. I want it too. <laughs> <laughs> what is his name? 
Lucas. Lucas. And, and, Isabel. and Isabella. I'm dedicating both. All right, let's stretch our hands. Wow. Father, thank you for this precious gift. And we ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that your holy presence come down upon Lucas. Use him for your glory. Seal him with the Spirit. May the blessing of the Lord rest upon you. May you walk with Jesus all your days. May you walk by the river and know the fruitful life of the Holy Spirit. And may his blessed presence fill you. May you serve him and declare him in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for your glory and your presence. Come on, church, just agree with me. Thank you for your glory and your presence. Thank you, Jesus, for lives and voices that will serve you. Isabella, know the Lord. Walk with him. Walk in the shadow of the Most High. May he be your rear guard and your shepherd, leading you, leading you through this dark world in his glorious light. May you know the Lord deeply and declare his word to your families. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And then last but not least, we have the Zavalos family, and they're dedicating their baby Mia to the Lord. Mia and Nathan. And Nathan, both. All right, baby, you want to go that way? Let's stretch our hands towards sweet Mia. Father, clothe Mia in your presence as we dedicate this life to you as your church. Thank you that she will belong to you and know you and love you and walk with you. May your word dwell richly within her. And may she live in the glorious light of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Nathan, right? Thank you for Nathan, Father. May he be clothed in the oil of heaven. May he be mighty. May he be bold and humble. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that he would lead his family in the ways of God and that every seed sown by these parents would not fall by the wayside, that the, that the seed they're sowing in their children would bear fruit a hundredfold in the name of Jesus, that they'd walk in the way where you protect the seed of the word. Let the word dwell richly in Nathan, in Jesus' mighty and holy, glorious name. We dedicate you, Nathan, to the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. 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 Precious. God has heard your prayers. Keep sowing them. Come on, guys. Can we just give the Lord all the praise? Thank you, Lord. Come on, yeah, let's bless this beautiful. So beautiful. <laughs> One more. No, she's out. All right. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, we can give the Lord all the glory. Well, that is baptizing and dedicating people is just such a privilege. I love being a pastor most of the time. No, I'm sorry. I do love it. It's an honor. It's an honor. I remember going to uh, visit a, a really well-known pastor once and... Uh, we were supposed to have lunch afterward. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, I'll get to lunch as soon as I am through fulfilling my pastoral duties. And I thought, well, what is that? Because he had already finished preaching. And so his assistants invited me in the back. It's a massive city of a facility, the thousands of people there. And I went, and he was baptizing people with his staff. And there were only like... 20 people in there. There are probably about 5,000 in the main service. 20 people in the back. But I remember his diligence and the, the seriousness and the holiness uh, regarding his view on what he got to do. And so speaking of that, tonight I'm going to be baptizing people. And uh, yeah, and I won't use this person's name, but if you watch Jesus image or follow us in any way, you probably know who I'm talking about. I kind of would like him to feel the heat, a little sweat right now. 
I was, he wanted to get baptized tonight, and he said he couldn't because of the Super Bowl. I thought, huh? You don't want to be raised in Christ? You'd rather watch, and I, I love sports, but I thought, oh, we need revival. Speaking of that, we will be gathering tonight. And we're going to be seeking the Lord. And uh, so tonight will be a great test for so many of you regulars on Sunday night. We've just inserted an AI technology into the cameras. <laughs> Facial recognition. We'll know who's here and who's not. No, it's a joke. It's actually a joke. It probably exists, but we don't have it. In all seriousness, tonight uh, is going to be a Holy Spirit prayer meeting. And uh, we are going after heaven tonight. Uh, there's more. I said there's more. I so love and honor all of you, and I'm honored to be a part of this house and to just play a small part of what the Lord is doing here. Uh, being a shepherd here is an honor. But as much as I love everybody who comes, I'm more after Jesus. I want him. He's the one who makes us a family. It's only in his light that we can see light. So there's more. I said there's more, church. And so as we did two weeks ago, uh, we are going to be seeking the Lord tonight. Uh, Pastor Benny called me yesterday. He said, I'm coming, not to preach. We're coming to seek the Lord. And uh, he likes to hang out in the back and monitor us on the screen. <laughs> Make sure our teaching is solid and that we're flowing in the spirit properly. Thank God for fathers who love us, huh? He really just loves it here. He doesn't do that to us. But he does seek the Lord with us as he's back there. Tonight's going to be very special. Just record the Super Bowl. Just record it. Let's go after heaven. Let's, I mean, you don't even know who won the Super Bowl three years ago. You don't know who, fin who, who lost in the Super Bowl four years ago. But you remember a touch from God. I said, let's go after heaven tonight, church. Uh, I want to honor a dear friend who's here. Haley Braun, would you stand up? Haley. <laughs> Haley, who we love so much. She's come from... She's come from the distant land of Reading, which is easier to get from Orlando to London than Reading to Orlando by three hours. So, Haley, thanks for being here. And uh, we're all going after heaven together tonight. I wouldn't miss tonight for anything in the world. Um, our land, I just wanted to give you a building update, if that's okay. Um, can we just throw the imagery there up on the screen? We're gonna keep this in front of you very often. Um, we have submitted everything that we need to submit and uh, the, the city of Sanford has been precious and wonderful to work with, but they have got a lot going on. As you can imagine, that area and that corridor is exploding with growth. In fact, I, I actually read an article a couple years ago. I think, I don't know which newspaper it was. Somebody sent it to me. But the corridor that the land is in is like the next area of explosion in the Metroplex. So God has literally given us how many acres? 29? 29 acres right dead smack in the middle of where all the growth is happening. And it looks like they're trying to build a connector. We don't know for sure if that's gonna work, but they're trying to build a connector road right by our property that connects it to 417. So I believe if this happens, this is the Lord. He's connecting. I mean, then you're a straight shot to the airport. You're connecting the entire Metroplex. So We've submitted everything because of the workload that the city is dealing with. They're experiencing delays. It's one of the things we are gonna pray for tonight. As a church family, this mountain must be cast into the sea. Amen? Uh, and, and, and again, they've, they're kind and they've been wonderful, but they are overloaded and it seems like they don't have the staff right now to, to keep up with the growth in that area. But it's time to pray. I said it's time to pray. You know, nations are made of people. People. And God can move the hearts of people. 
And, and uh, once this is done, I know in my heart this is going to uh, usher us into a new dimension in God's glory that we've never known. Yeah. There's something holy about consistently being in a place. And so gathering tonight uh, and praying through, offering the Lord our hearts is incredibly important because as we come into the light of the Spirit, the Lord begins to purify motive. Now listen, when motive begins to be purified, it is vital to inheriting the promised land. You don't want to go around the mountain longer than you need to. And I don't want that for us. As I mean, I can't believe we're, we get to meet here. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful? That we get to meet in the place that Pastor Benny built in 1984? I mean, who could have written a story like this? That the cross would be in the same spot I got healed as a 12-year-old boy? That ev the, when people come to get saved, they get saved literally at the same altar I got saved at. So I'm grateful for the story. But God has given us that place, and he wants to write a new story. And a story in his presence. So tonight we're going to gather, and mountains will be cast into the sea. I said mountains will be cast into the sea. Amen? All right. I got stirred up. Oh, let me, let me just quickly talk, talk to you about Jesus 24. We are coming to California for the first time. For the first time. Haley, we need the squad from Reading to come on down. And I talked actually to Tom and Leslie a, a few days ago. Uh, we heard from the Lord to take that year-end event to the West Coast. And they are registering by the hundreds. Amazingly, months and months out, they are coming from all over the world. So for our Orlando family, let's go. Come on, let's go out there. This is a domestic missions trip. You don't have to travel overseas to be part of missions. You just need to go next door. All right, so let's get out there. I'm, I'm expecting to see you guys. Let's pray. Let's seek the Lord. Much of our choir will be going out as well. Many of our students, if you want to come June 6th through the 8th, we will be meeting at the Anaheim Convention Center in the arena that is connected to it, which is called the Old Anaheim Arena. Miss Kuhlman preached there. The Full Gospel Businessmen uh, preached there. Pastor Benny preached one of the greatest youth conferences maybe to ever touch our nation in 2003, I believe, there. It was a marking, marking moment, and this place has seen a great move of God. Let's get out there and see the fulfillment of Orange County and Orange County connecting for the glory of God. Amen. So that's June 6th through the 8th. If you're watching right now from around the world, now's the time to register and come. We would love to see you there. March 22nd, we, we will be uh, hosting the next leg of the Jesus Tour on the West Coast, which is in Phoenix. And to all of you, I would say probably Phoenix has been the most consistent uh, request for us to come out out of, maybe, I don't know, maybe any city, possibly. In New York. Y'all are going solo on that one. <laughs> I'm not a city guy, but <laughs> Phoenix is about as big as I want to go. But no, if the Lord sends us, we're coming. Uh, Phoenix, Arizona, March 22nd, West Coast. Come on out. It'd be an honor to have you. You can register a QR code. Okay. I want to run a quick, uh, a quick video. So if we could just prep it, and I'm just going to kind of lead into it. It's the one I sent you on this morning. Okay, um, two days ago I was watching golf and, <laughs> and uh, I, I don't watch a ton of Christian television. Um, you know, I don't have a problem with it. I'm grateful for it. I was just raised in it and on it. And, 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 and then, it, you know, the invention of the golf channel didn't help my Christian television hours watched. It's, it's pretty much the only channel that I watch occasionally, some ESPN and yeah, that's probably, probably about it. Yeah, Jess is like, yeah, that is exactly all that's ever. All right. But as I was flipping through, I flipped through Daystar, and Daystar had been so kind to us in the early days. And I saw uh, Marcus Lamb, who's gone on to be with the Lord, uh, teaching on the Holy Spirit. And he showed a video about an outpouring of the Spirit that took place in the 90s, uh, with the indigenous people of, the, of uh, 
the North American Northwest. So way up in the Arctic. And um, uh, now, let me just say this. All I've done is watch the video. I, I do not know the people uh, who experienced this outpouring. I don't know what they've done prior or since. So this isn't like me saying I am connected to the ministry. I, I don't know. All I can tell you is I sense the glorious presence of God on this clip and it stirred my soul and I don't think I came across it by accident. So I sent it to Yohan this morning saying, I think I'm gonna listen to the Holy Spirit and see how the Lord is leading us, but I think the Lord uh, wants to stir our faith with this video. So can we, can we get the lights ready, make sure the volume is, is up and ready to roll, and let's just, let's just take our attention to this video for a second. Like many in the Pond Inlet community, James Ariak sees himself as a spiritual descendant of Anguatizawak and a spiritual disciple of John Turner. The planting of the word occurred into our parents. And our parents, through the planting of the seed, bore fruit. Back in February 1996, something happened. Throughout Pond Inlet, small groups of intercessors were pounding heaven with prayers for revival. Providing inspiration for this assault were two men with big hearts and worn out knees. Arctic evangelist Billy Arnacook and local pastor Moses Kayak. That's when the people were convicted and were drawn uh, to the Lord in a great numbers. And uh, they were so convicted that they, had to, they felt they had to clean their houses. The dirt paths leading to John Turner's old church were suddenly congested with desperate townspeople. Everyone, it seemed, wanted to get rid of their illicit drugs, pornography, and heavy metal music. It was coming in like a flood. We had a big can, garbage can, right in front of the altar every night. They kept filling it up and filling it up. Every night, they went to the dump and burned them up. After five nights, the town dump was full. As community leaders considered incinerating the remaining items, they received encouragement from an unlikely source, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They had a bonfire uh, right about here where the iceberg is. The Mounties even provided logistical support. Five they gas. said, we can even provide gas to burn up the junk. Nearly the entire community turned out for the burn. <laughs> According to the RCMP, the value of illicit property destroyed during the revival was a staggering eighty to one hundred thousand dollars. It was a deep repentance. The Holy Spirit Himself was speaking to the people. The whole community was completely transformed. The afterglow of this momentous occasion warmed hearts for months to come, but it also hinted at a fire yet unrealized, a fire so remarkable it would be talked about half a world away. February 28th, it happened in the middle of winter, February 28th, 1999. Believers had gathered for a week of revival meetings at the Anglican Church. Hungry for God and troubled by new reports of community drug use, they decided to add a special Sunday afternoon youth service. Among those leading the meeting were Pastor Moses Kayak and his ministerial colleagues Joshua and James Ariak all great-grandsons of the original lightkeeper, Anguatizawak. An invitation was offered for youth who felt they wanted to come closer to God. Worship leader Louis Ariak was praying over the youth that had gathered around the altar. I felt so close to God and he kept giving me this verse that says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Something start to happen that uh, was out of our control. This uh, noise started coming. Yeah, it started softly, like you can barely hear it. A dual cassette deck used to record the service was still running off the soundboard. Right away, I wanted to stop. But it kept getting louder and, and I started to notice that people were kind of getting a little nervous. It was so 
strong. So strong. It was so loud that everything started to shake. Fire went right through me. It sounded like a jet. Things start to shake. I started to shake. I told myself, there's no jets in Pondemort. After this extraordinary visitation, it was evident the moment still had power. Every time I thought about it, I, I was uh, greatly humbled. Uh, thinking, thinking that uh, the Almighty God can visit us. When Pastor Moses Kayak first heard the low-pitched rumbling, he walked over to the church soundboard to adjust the settings. I tried this, not stop, tried this, no stop. When these efforts failed to correct the situation, he quickly turned down the master control. When this too failed, he shut the system off completely. Still, the sound and the recording continued. It shouldn't have been recorded. It's only by the miracle of God. They made through the town. He was completely humble to the point where he wanted to continually come before God, kneel, and ask for prayer, and ask for the cleansing of the heart, to become pure before him. Wow, amazing. Amazing. May the Lord do it in us. So let's pray tonight. John Kilpatrick says, you have no right to cash a check in revival without the deposit of prayer. So let's gather in the Lord's presence. Amen. How many of you sense his touch now? Okay, let's take our Bibles, please. pray, Holy Lord, teach us your word that is Jesus, the wonderful Holy Spirit, uh, purge and cleanse us, that we would receive the word of the Lord with hungry, open, focused hearts, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Okay, take your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. And as I begin teaching, I'm going to ask that you stay as still and as still as possible. Sunday morning crowd's good at that. Sunday night needs a little discipleship. And we're going to end the portion of the study of the temptation of Jesus this morning, and I'm going to move on from there, but for those of you who don't know, by the way, how many of you are here from a different nation? Would you just lift your hand? God bless you. Honored to have you. Anyone? Yep, so many. Where are you from up there? Finland. Wow. Did I hear properly? Netherlands. Netherlands. Welcome. God bless you. How about you all here? Sweden. Bulgaria. Oh, wow. From Bulgaria. Wonderful. Anyone else? Yes. Dominican Republic. I want to go there. It looks beautiful. Last one, yeah. Brazil. Brazil. <laughs> you guys are almost omnipresent. You're not, but you're <laughs> just about everywhere. We, uh, for those of you who don't know, and to all of our first-time visitors, thank you for being here. If you're here for the first time, would you lift your hands? Wow, what an honor to have you. Can we, can we just welcome them? Thank you. 
We've been tracking the life of the Lord and I taught on the baptism of the Lord for three weeks. And then I have moved into the baptism, or I should say the temptation of the Lord. And uh, today I just kind of want to tie that knot and move on from there. But we're going to end with some incredibly powerful scripture. So Luke chapter 4, I'll read to you. Verse 1, then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Who led him? I'll ask you one more time. Come on, with boldness. Who led him? Spirit. And is the Spirit the Lord? Yes. If you qualify to lead Jesus, you must be the Lord. Verse 2, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Did the Holy Spirit tempt Jesus? Did he allow the temptation to happen? Absolutely. Jesus ate nothing in all that time and had become very hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, no. It's the best thing to say to the, to the devil, by the way. Don't start all these conversations with him. It's bizarre when people do that. No. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and the authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. Underline that, worship me. And Jesus replied, the scriptures say, say the scriptures. You must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem. You're hearing that language? We're talking about a wild experience here. The devil took Jesus to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. I mean, how many of you think Jesus would be pretty visible standing up on that temple I don't have time to get into that. You can come to Jesus School and we'll, we'll, we'll get after stuff like that. And said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, so now the devil is quoting the scripture. He will order his angels to protect and guard you. And they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. I love this. Jesus responded. The scriptures also say, so he adds an also. You must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. Just side note, typically that next opportunity is usually when we are worn out and tired or following great victory. That's the biblical narrative. Jezebel sends a threat to Elijah after his greatest victory. We know that Jesus faced great temptation again in the garden of Gethsemane when he was tired. So, Oftentimes, the worst temptations come after great victory, listen carefully, when we are worn out, and lastly, through people close to us. Judas. It's also worth noting that Judas was possessed by the devil when he received communion. Read John's Gospel. He dips the bread, well, when he receives communion improperly, with the wrong heart, with the desire to betray Jesus. That's what the Bible says. He dips the bread, and the devil entered him. 
And so what looked like covenant life was not covenant life in the heart of Judas. He had always been a thief. He wrongfully received Holy Communion. The devil saw that as a door. And that's why Paul writes, when we don't discern the body of Jesus, we receive communion improperly, many are sick and die among us. So I believe one of the reasons the church is so sick, one of, not the only reason, one of, is because we do not receive enough Holy Communion throughout the body of Christ and because we receive it improperly. We don't take the elements and throw them three rows over. That, I don't understand that. So, we see this here, and the devil comes to tempt Jesus. Now, there is something I'd like to turn, I'd like to turn your attention to. Go to Psalm 91. I found it so interesting that the devil uses the Psalms, specifically Psalm 91, to use against the Lord. Which again, if you take the scripture and attempt to use it or understand it outside of the lens of Christ crucified, you will misuse it eventually. Now in Psalm 91, the devil actually uses verse 12, verse 11. This is what he's using in Luke 4, verses 10 through 11. So he's quoting Psalm 91, 10 through 11 and 12. It's very interesting to me though that he leaves out, this was very convenient, that he leaves out verse 13. Ryan, would you grab that mic? Quite convenient for the devil to not read verse 13 because it doesn't work out so well for him. Go ahead and read that. It says, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, <laughs> the young lion and the serpent you shall trample under. He left that promise out when he quoted the scriptures to Jesus. He forgot to tell him, and by the way, you're going to crush me. <laughs> and I bring that to you because the way by which we handle scripture is impossible to describe the importance of. We must look at scripture in a certain light. Go to Psalm 119, Ryan. And I want you to read verse 160. That's a long chapter. The entirety of your word is truth. Stop. Say that again. The again. entirety of your word is truth. Anybody have the ESV? No? Okay. The ESV reads, the sum, the sum of thy word is truth. If I'm going to land on truth, I cannot take one text and base my life on it. The sum of your word is truth. That means the entirety of Holy Scripture, yes, from Genesis to Revelation, is truth. All of it. And the devil very conveniently chose not to quote Scripture in that light. As I said, he left out, verse 13, you will crush the head of the serpent. You will crush lions and cobras. Of course, he would leave that out. Left out Genesis 3, that this man would come who is the serpent crusher through the bruising of his own heel. And Jesus replies by saying, the scriptures also say. Listen carefully. Jesus was armed with three weapons 
in his temptation. Write these down. Number one, not in order of importance. Number one, solitude. Solitude. May I also add, solitude is different than isolation. You want to get creamed by the devil and start believing lies and have the audacity to actually communicate those lies. Step one, isolate yourself. The devil is uh, very seasoned. He has 6,000 years of experience. And he loves to start conversations with Eve while she's all alone walking through the garden that she would call a life of prayer to simply get her to engage in a conversation rather than her just talking to Jesus. Okay? Solitude is different than isolation. Isolation is the thought, I can't trust you. The body of Christ is jacked up. I'm doing this all alone. Or I'm just going to launch my own house church. There's nothing wrong with house churches. I come from one. But the thought that a house is more holy than a building is idolatry. It's idolatry because we are placing the credit upon the structure rather than the presence of God who makes the place a church. Little crowds can be unholy. Big crowds can be unholy. How many people are in a marriage? Two. Thank God for, for now. Let's just pray it stays there. <laughs> Two. How many of you think there is such thing as an unholy, unrighteous marriage? It just took two. Yeah. Two. All right? So a small group is not more pure than a big group, and a big group is not more pure than a small group. Yeah. The location is not the point. Yeah. Yieldedness to the Lord is the point. Yeah. It is the Lord's presence that distinguishes a place and makes it a church. All right? Isolation will destroy you. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about willful solitude. Okay? Under the canopy and lordship of the scriptures. This is really important. So number one, solitude. He's armed with solitude. Number two, prayer. Prayer. True prayer. Now, these two go hand in hand. We know that Psalm 91 makes a promise. Let's just look at it since we're there. Psalm 91 makes a promise in verse 1. Ryan, would you read verse 1 just throughout the entire verse? It says... He who dwells in the He who what? Dwells. dwells. Does it say he who visits? Does it say who, he who frequently shows up to the secret place? No. Dwelling speaks of tabernacling and residing. He who builds a life and a lifestyle. Keep reading, right? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Okay, this is the realm of secrecy. This is where it is just you and the Lord. You must have a life of dwelling that rests between you and Jesus. Has to be the most important part of your life. The most important part. When it comes to spiritual disciplines, which are not bad words. I'm talking about disciplines <laughs> being welcomed by a certain people called disciples. Disciples. These disciplines, if I had to list them, step one, go in your room, shut the door. Spend time with Jesus all alone. You say, I'm too busy. Then you are too busy. I would take it beyond busy and just say distracted. I would say that uh, Ishmael has been engaged. 
to your heart if you're too busy to pray. So here we have prayer marrying this solitude and keep reading, Ryan. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall what? Abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Yeah, shall abide. Now many people will say, I don't need to spend time with Jesus because I abide all day long. It's unbiblical. It's completely unbiblical because Psalm 91 teaches us that the secret place births the abiding place. You know, wars are won in this solitude that maybe the masses will never know about. Holy ancient wars are won when a man or woman closes the door. This is where a man or woman learns to put the passions of the body out. James writes about the tongue being a rudder that's difficult to control, but it steers the whole ship. The Bible teaches that it's easier to take a city than to tame a tongue. When a man or woman learns how, listen, listen to my language, to just be in the presence of God, to just be, great wars are won. How can a man or woman lead a people if he can't sit in a room? How can a man or woman lead a people or the nations if he cannot control his members? It's that feeling that when you're alone with Jesus, I can't wait to get out of here. I've got stuff to do. I can't wait another five minutes here. I'm, 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 I'm bored and I'm antsy. That's what we call the passions. The strength of the flesh is rearing its head. That's actually a good thing if you'll wait beyond it. When, when those worms start to come up like they do after a rain shower down here in Florida, when it pours, you see those worms come up and those sandhill cranes come and they start eating them all. The water brings those worms to the surface. You have to remember, the presence of Jesus is the diagnostic and the medicine. Listen, what do I mean by that? It's the x-ray and the surgery. You don't know what's wrong with you until you get with him. You don't know what needs to go until it rains on your soul. We need the rain to reveal the worms. And once it starts raining, these worms start coming to the surface and that's usually when we leave. So they stay around too long. When you learn to wait in silence and be with the Lord, beyond that antsiness, beyond that temptation, that's where the wonderful dove of heaven comes and starts picking off those worms. And this is the place, listen carefully, where our capacity increases spiritually. Spiritually. This is the true place of maturity. I, I, I answer this question. If you don't have multiple services, let's just say you don't. Why has it become part of American church culture to keep the sermon at under 30 minutes? And answer the question. I'll tell you what it is, the fear of man. It's the thought and worship sets, they actually have studied this. My friend, <laughs> I won't tell you who, you love him. My friend was approached by leaders and they told him that studies show people don't like to sing longer than 28 minutes. 28, not 25, <laughs> not 30, 28. And my friend looked at them and tears ran down his cheek. He said, well, we do at my church. How did we get there? We got there because flesh started calling the shots. 
How can the word dwell richly within us if we won't sit under it, even when we're tired? See, <laughs> listen, if you get a little tired and distracted, which I'm sure has happened in everybody as I'm preaching right now, that's fine. Ooh, what do I do? You just focus again. What do I do to fall asleep with Jesus? Wake up and keep going. You're sleeping anyways. But how did we get there? I'll tell you. Flesh started leading. Flesh started leading. And when leaders are not, are not waiting beyond their comfort zone in secret, it's impossible to give that away to a people. You, all right, listen, you will not find experiential, listen to my language, experiential union with the Holy Spirit scrolling. I don't care if it's 2024. The ancient way into the knowledge of God that is divine intimacy is stillness. Psalm 4610. Ryan, read it, please. I'm having fun this morning. We're going to see disciples emerge. And spend less time wondering what's wrong with the church. More time wondering how beautiful Jesus is and what's wrong with you. Go ahead. Be still and know that I am God. Be what? Still. Be still. That doesn't mean just physical, you know, the silent stare game. That's not what I'm talking about. But that is important. I, hate, I don't hate to tell you. I'm glad to tell you. Jesus doesn't kiss moving targets. Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Go there. Is this all right? Oh, because friend, look, 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 look. You follow the cloud long enough, your day is coming to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil. I'm not going to give you details, but trust me when I tell you. I can tell you, as somebody who's standing before the Lord right now and will in the age to come, the devil is incredibly real, and he will come knocking on your door the moment you press in a little too far in his eyes. He will try to scare you off of the holy pursuit of God. He's not so freaked out by your gifting. Let me tell you what freaks him out. Authority that is purchased in secret. That, that makes him incredibly afraid. And through fear and intimidation, he will come your way and try to bargain with you. He is a master negotiator. And I'm not telling you by secondhand experience. I'll just say that. He is a master negotiator. Did he not negotiate through Pharaoh with the children of Israel? You stay back. The rest can go. The flocks can stay. What did Moses say? Absolutely not. We're all going. All of our animals, all of us, the children, the workers, all of us. We're going. That's the way of Christ. The way of the devil is negotiation. He will ask you, well, it may not sound just like this for you. But he'll ask you something like this. How much for what you have? What's your price? What's your price? The notoriety your price? Being known on social media, is that your price? Having a big ministry, your price? Packing the pews, your price? Gaining money, your price? In your kingdom business? You can't have a kingdom business and compromise. What's your price? He loves to ask that question. How much for what God has given you? And he's not talking about cars and houses. You know what he's after? The glory. Oneness with Jesus. Read Song of Solomon, chapter 1. It says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Stop there. Let him what? Come on, talk to me. Let him what? Let him what? With what? Keep reading. Let him kiss me, singular, 
with the plural kisses. What's the Shulamite saying? He kissed me once. I've got to have more. I've got to have more. Now, can you kiss a moving target? No. It must be face to face, eye to eye, breath to breath, heart to heart. Stillness sets me up for one kiss and another and another and another and another. It's not normal to want just one. One sets me up to be ruined the rest of my life. And if he kissed you while you were still the first time, let him do it again. And in that kiss, don't forget this, there is a breath exchange, a life exchange, a touch exchange. When the devil knocks on your door and the temptations come, it's God's will that you win. And I'm telling you how this morning. Prayer and solitude go hand in hand. This is different than prayer in isolation. Solitude still values the gathering of the body of believers. Isolation doesn't trust the body of believers. Solitude is bent on Christian love. Isolation is built upon a fence. Hallelujah. All right. Lastly, I'm going to go till 1210. All right. Who gives a rip? All right. Now, look. Look, do you, do you know that leaders will give an account for their leadership in your life before heaven? That's what the Bible says, that I'll give an account for the condition of your souls. Now, I can't do all the work for you. But I've gone to preach the scriptures faithfully enough so that when I stand there, the Lord doesn't hold me accountable for something I didn't offer to Nathan and Kathleen biblically. That, that freaks me out in the best way and, and in the worst way. It's scary. We need leaders like that again who unapologetically teach the Bible. If you're watching, don't you become a slave of, of opinion. Preach the Bible. Regardless of the cost, preach the word of God. Divide it and break it properly and faithfully. And the church must get used to receiving the unadulterated, pure milk of the word. Amen? All right, lastly, the third weapon, the first was solitude, the second was prayer, the third is the scriptures. How did Jesus answer every time? The scriptures say, it is written. Now, think Bible now, go back to Luke 4. When you look at the temptations of Jesus, the first one comes in verse 3 of Luke 4. What was the first word or the first few words? If you are what? Come on, talk to me. Put it up on the screen. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God. What did the devil just hear at the baptism of Jesus? This is my beloved son. Do you think Adam and Eve knew they were like the Lord? Of course, because they would not have been able to fellowship with the Lord if they were not made in his image and likeness. What's the first thing the devil said to Eve? It was regarding the word of God. The devil said, you will not surely die. You will not die if you sin. And what did the Lord say? For in the day you eat of it, you will certainly die. What did the devil come with? A question that questioned what God said. He may not automatically deny it in the beginning, in the beginning of the conversation with you, 
but he will get you to question it. And so we see this here with Jesus. If you are the son of God, and the father had already announced Jesus as being the son of God, and the cosmos heard it, the heavens heard it, the animals heard it, the air heard it, the Jordan heard it, John heard it, everything and everyone heard the declaration of the Lord God Almighty. This is my son. Now if anyone could have looked back at the devil and used his resume and experience as the second member of the Godhead, if anyone could have used that as a weapon against the devil, it could have been Jesus. Now that didn't land and it should have. Some of y'all are tired. Remember what I said. Wait beyond the agitation. If anyone could have answered the devil with his highlight reel, it could have been the incarnate Christ. He could have said, I made you. I made that son. I made this dirt. I made the rock. You're telling me to convert. I made it all. You used to worship me. He could have talked about the interactions of the Trinity. He could have talked about how he formed the stars and keeps them by the word of his power. He could have talked about all of that. He didn't. Step one, it is written. You better get good at that. When the devil comes your way, you don't go, oh, let me tell you what happened to me at a revival meeting. No. No, because he'll try to get you to doubt that too. Now, now here's the thing. If God, Jesus is God. No, <laughs> I've got work to do. <laughs> Jesus is God. God, duh, get it, get it, get it through your head. Jesus is Jehovah. Ah, he is not the Father. He's one with the Father. Same in essence with the Father. He is God. The Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Jesus is as much Jehovah as the Spirit. Yes. This is God teaching us how to win. It's a good idea to listen. I just think it'd be dumb to choose another route. If anyone could have shot a lightning bolt or blown on him or whatever some of us charismatics love to do or shake or buckle over <laughs> or wave a flag. I love our flaggers. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm going to join the team one day. No, that'll never happen. <laughs> That's not how you do it. <laughs> I can only imagine you waving a flag over the devil. Probably just duck. Don't, listen, don't choose another route. I don't care if you saw it on YouTube, heard it on a podcast, heard a story about it. No, no, we are Christians. We are sons of the Savior. We're disciples of the Master. If he did it, we do it. Step one, the temptation comes. It is written. Oh, man. You'll win every time. Now, for those of us who don't like the Old Testament, you don't like the scriptures. Jesus didn't come up with his response in verse 4. Ryan, go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Now, this is the book. Oh, man. If I did a survey... Name the top five books you conveniently skip. You know Deuteronomy is one of them. <laughs> and you know why it's one of them? Because we don't look for Jesus there. We're trying to figure it out. That's reading your Bible according to the knowledge of good and evil. No, 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 no. We look for Jesus everywhere. And the word Deuteronomy simply means, it comes from the Greek word, veftero, second law. It's the second, not a different law, it's the second utterance of the holy law of God. Read it, Ryan. 
Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. It says, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone. Whoa! You want to know where Jesus pulled that one out of? Deuteronomy 8, 3. Not out of the stars. He pulled it out of the text. See, we have an issue with that because we want everything to be more of like, like Tinkerbell with pixie dust everywhere. We don't understand he's the God. Listen, listen carefully. He's the incarnate God who wants to fill all things with himself. The natural will always be connected to the supernatural. We are Christians. That's why holy acts, prophetic acts, the sacraments of the church, think about it. When I take oil and put it on your body, it's touching your skin, but it refreshes the soul. It starts with the natural and does a spiritual work. Tonight we'll baptize people and you're all gonna be there. You're not gonna be eating nachos and queso. You're going to be here feasting on the presence of the Lord. Tonight, tonight, we're going to take real bodies, human bodies, human vessels with uh, like skin. Skin is going to go into real water that came out of a faucet, not the Jordan. Skin, hair, gray ones, rebellious ones. They're going into real water. And so we call this a sacrament. The great mystery, the Greek word is mysterion. It points to a higher reality. Do you getting it? So while bodies are going into natural water, flesh and blood goes into natural water, spiritually, spiritually, they come forth from the natural water, alive in Jesus, separated from the world, dead to the past works, consciences cleansed just by going in to water. Are you getting it? Are you understanding our Lord? Remember, He's the incarnate one. He has a desire to fill all things with Himself, even the sky. That's why He ascended, one of the reasons. But as He ascended, as He ascended above princes and powers, He began to fill the heavens with His glory. And the scriptures teach that the cross itself cleansed the heaven, made a way. When the Bible teaches that the earth is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God, that means the natural earth is groaning for the day of the resurrection. The manifestation of the sons points to the resurrection. When Adam sinned, the grass felt it. The soil felt it. It was cursed. So then rather, rather than tend the soil, man now has to work the soil just to get by. Tending and working are way different. The earth's crying out for that again. It misses the moisture. It misses the priestly ministry that through the blood of Jesus comes to redeem and make right again. Well, one day when we are fully glorified in Jesus in the resurrection, when we get glorified bodies, the earth will stop groaning at the coming of the Lord. It's awesome. What, what's the point? What's the point? Do not diminish the mere reading of a scripture that, has, that is pressed into the paper with ink from China. <laughs> you do not need a new prophetic moment or a shofar blown over your head. When the devil comes, do what Jesus did. It is written. It is written. Now, if you say, what if you don't leave the first time? Jesus took three. Do it again. Batter him. Flog him with Holy Scripture. Flog him. Hit him back. Hit him back. Build a reputation in heaven and in hell that if he hits you, you hit back. You hit back. Hit back with the word. Do not embrace. I feel the power of God. Do not embrace manly fallen methods and try to defeat the one who birthed, who, who birthed them. You'll never beat him with evil. Hit back with scripture. 
Thank you, Lord. <sighs> Deuteronomy 6.13, Ryan. Now, hold on. Jesus says, listen, that the kingdoms of the world have been handed over to him. I'm sorry, the devil says, the kingdoms of this world have been handed over to him. Verse 5. And that's true. Adam actually handed it over. But so badly did Satan want to be worshipped that he offered another way to Jesus being king. Remember though, the only way to glory is through the cross. That's why Jesus had no problem dismissing the crowd. When they said, let's make him king. He, he, he feeds us. That's what we do today. More money in my pocket. I'm voting for him. This and that, all that. They wanted to do that with Jesus. He goes, no, 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 no. Everything goes to the tree. Everything goes to the tree. Dismiss the crowds, huh? And so now the devil says, worship me and I'll give you these kingdoms. Read his reply. Let me read the reply and then Ryan, you're gonna read Deuteronomy 6, 13. The scriptures say, this is verse eight of Luke four. You must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Ryan, read Deuteronomy 6.13. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. There you go. Jesus once again pulls it out of Deuteronomy 6. One of the books we don't want to read. <laughs> How dumb. <laughs> How do you say dumb in Spanish? Someone. Stupido. So it is so dumb. It's so dumb. Our last one. Verse twelve. Well, actually, let's go to verse nine, and then I'll, we'll land the plane. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. That's why you don't believe every encounter you have. Oh, I had this. I, I, oh, trust me, I've had plenty of encounters. I love them every time they happen. As recently as last night. As recently as last night. So don't, don't misunderstand me. But you need to know what to look for in them to know who they're from. See, here's the deal with solitude. You start doing that, which is important. God will start doing business with you at a heart level. Stuff comes up to the surface. You discover God and you discover you. This is the Colosseum where gladiators are supposed to defeat the beasts. Right in here. All alone. You have to know what is from God and what is from hell. Deuteronomy 6, 16. Just turn there. Let me keep reading, Ryan. Get ready for that one. If you are the son of God, jump off, verse 9. The scriptures say, as I read earlier, he will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on the stone. It sounds like such a pleasant promise coming from the mouth of the deceiver. Verse 12, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Read verse 16, Ryan. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massah. Wait a minute. That means God is looking, listen, listen up. Help, help me there, Joel, if you don't mind. Help me, Lord, get this right. There's a way of doing things that looks like faith to the natural man that is actually testing the Lord. Oftentimes we think we're taking risk, but we're actually testing the Lord. 
through our impatience. And one of the great traps, don't forget this, the one of the great traps is the trap of momentum. When you live around momentum, which could easily happen here, when you live around momentum, you stop going to the Lord for the small things. And you start, oh, you start presuming. And David calls the sin of presumption, keep, David says, keep me from the great sin of presumption. Keep me from living a life that assumes to know exactly what you want me to do without going to you. And this is what Jesus refuses, even though a scripture is thrown at him, and he throws another scripture at the devil. The scriptures also say, the sum of thy word. You need another one. The scriptures also say, do not test the Lord your God. In closing, what I want for us, here's the challenge. By next Sunday, five new scriptures memorized. Five. All right? If you want to join my journey, start in John 1. Start in John 1. My goal for the year is to memorize the whole gospel of John. And I'm working at it daily. I have to do it by writing it down. So I write down a verse 10, 20 times, pray through it, hit the other verse, and I'm just going through it. Steph's doing the same thing right now, she told me. What's the point? You take these stones from the scripture. Notice Jesus didn't pull out parchment. Now, you can, but there'll be moments where you cannot. You're at a hospital room. The doctor says the baby's gonna be born dead. I've done this. You're standing there as a man of God. The family's looking at you. Please, please do something. You've got to have your five smooth stones ready. There are times where you can't whip out the parchment and learn it then. You get the weaponry processed now. Like David didn't, didn't have to wonder what he was going to do. I know what to do with this giant. I'm going to kill him the way I killed the lion and bear. He's going down. Five scriptures between now and next Sunday. Five, five verses that I'm asking you all, this is the challenge, that you're gonna memorize them and be able to whip them out of your pocket like a switchblade in a street fight. The next time the devil comes at you with a lion of temptation. Huh? So, the next time the devil says to you, those people are jacked up, I, you can't do church anymore. There's no such thing as a, as, a, as a perfect church. Get away from them. Start it in your bedroom, be all alone. You're gonna go, hold on a second. The scriptures say, forsake not thy assembly. The scriptures say, I am with you, even in the midst of you, when you gather in my name. You must have Holy Scripture rooted deeply within you. And he won't come back until it's a more opportune time. And then you whoop on him again. I said you whoop on him again. Amen. All right. Do you receive that this morning? You receive that? Okay. With every head bowed and eye closed, please. We're about to receive Holy Communion. And without anyone moving, this is the most sacred time of the service. Just want you to still your hearts. Just sit there, please. Sit there very calmly. And I want you right now with eyes closed, hearts stilled. If there is sin in your life that needs to go, if you're sitting in this room feeling shame, feeling condemnation, feeling the effects of sin, tired of them, you've been stuck in the bondage of it, you've been trying to free yourself, You've made a mess of your life. You've made a mess of your family. You've made a mess of your marriage. You've made a mess of your children. You've made a mess of relationships because of sin. You've been offended at God. Blamed him maybe for what you've done. 
Friend, let me tell you the only thing the Lord has done. He came to die for you. Have you blamed Jesus for the failures of people? Have you blamed the Lord for what men and women do? This morning, Jesus is still in the outstretched posture on the throne. John sees him in the book of Revelation as the lamb who had been slain. That means his arms are still open. Wounds still in his hands. Wounds still in his feet. Wound still on his side. Looking at you. Wanting you. Calling you, friend. And in about two or three minutes, we're all going to receive Holy Communion. It's a family meal. You don't want to receive communion and not be born again, not be free as a son is free. Many of you here once loved Jesus, you walked with him very closely and sin has gotten in the way and it's blown up that relationship. And the heart's not burning anymore. You miss it. I want everyone with head bowed and eye closed to seriously ponder what I'm saying. The Bible says, make thine election sure. As the Holy Spirit is here, settling upon your heart, you say, what's he looking for? Your response, your life, your heart. If you're any of those people, if you feel that convicting, wonderful, loving power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you right now, and you feel like, Michael, you're talking to me. There's something that you're saying that's resonating. I want you to raise your hand. Just quickly put your hand up. Thank you, Lord. What I'd like to do, if you raised your hand, many of you did. I want to give you the opportunity right now. Listen, and, and, and so many of these hands went up. Listen to me. Do not bow to fear. Do not. The Bible says, if you'll confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. Nobody wants that. That sounds horrible. If you raise your hand or wish you did, I want you to stand up right now in the presence of the believers. Just stand up right there in front of the families you're with. In front of the, yeah, this is awesome. Look around, guys. This is wonderful. Now, I want us, now that you've stood, God bless you. God bless all of you. Look at all of them in the balcony. God bless you. God bless you. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. And if you, if you stood up or you wish you did, if you didn't stand that first time and you feel like, you know what? I was afraid. I want you to get down here right now. If you stood up, get down here to the front, please. And we want to pray for you. Come quickly. Ushers, you can now get the communion elements ready. Praise you, Lord. Look, look at these young people weeping. Haley and Jess, can you start praying for some of them? Come on, front rows. Come on, guys. Give a, look, look at this. Give the Lord all the praise. All the praise. They're still coming from up, up there. Hallelujah. Come on, we can do better than that. This is wonderful. Carla, Amy, begin praying for people. Come, young man, come right up here. Come on, come right up here. Yeah, Blake, get on, get on them. Thank you. Look, they're still coming from, from the back, from up top. Come. Isn't this wonderful? Come on. This is wonderful. And you who are praying, I want you to pray the glory of God on them. I don't want any half-hearted prayers, you guys who are praying. No, no, let it fly. You pray into their life and their destiny. For those of you who came forward, the Lord is here. The Lord is hearing you. He's with you. And I want the entire house to pray this in one accord. Are you ready? Heavenly Father. Come on, let's lift our hands to heaven. Heavenly Father, I have sinned against you. Forgive my sin. Cleanse my soul. Wash me with the holy blood of Jesus. Precious Lord, this morning, I lay my life at your feet. I lay my life at the foot of Calvary. I declare that Jesus 
is the Son of the living God. That he suffered and died to pay for my sin, to cleanse me, to redeem me, and to bring me to himself. Jesus, three days later, you were raised from the dead and you are alive forevermore. Come on, say that one with boldness. You are alive forevermore. You are the Holy Son of God. And today, you are seated at the right hand of the Father and you are coming back again to rule and reign. Find me ready, Lord Jesus. I repent and I turn from this world and I give all my hope and all my trust to you and in you. In Jesus' mighty name, I belong to Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift your hands if you came forward. Church, just begin to pray in the Spirit. Wonderful Lord, you promised to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Blow like a mighty rushing wind. Fill them, clothe them, empower them with your glory and presence. Use them to be witnesses. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. As we're here, yeah, you can give the Lord praise. Those of you who came forward, listen carefully. You never need another day. You never need to have another day of defeat. You may have moments, but they are not the natural life for the Christian. Number one, read your Bible. Number two, pray. Number three, join a church family. If it's not here, find one. Give your heart to a people as imperfect as they will be. Okay? Number four, be baptized in water. This is vital. It's not a recommendation. Be baptized in water. Your old life is cut off, old habits cut off, temptations, cycles die in the water. It's where the dragons are slain in the Jordan. Amen. Number five, we ask the Lord to empower us with the Spirit. We already did that. And number six, before you leave the property today, I want you to text someone, not about Jesus' image. That's not the point. You don't even have to mention Jesus' image. I want you to text them and tell them what Jesus did for you today. I want you to do that. And as you give glory to the Lord, a protection will come and a beautiful life in Jesus will begin. Amen? Okay. Can we all stand, please, if you came forward? Ushers, would you come down with the communion elements? Can we give the Lord praise just one more time? Thank you, Jesus. We can serve them first. We'll serve them first. So the way we do communion here at Jesus Images, you'll come down and get the elements, take them back to your seat, receive them there. I'm going to ask that nobody receive alone. If you see somebody by themselves, please invite them. If you are by yourself, ask somebody if you can have communion with them. Let's just lift our hands to heaven as the, as the ushers prepare. Wonderful Holy Spirit, this is not mere bread and juice. Jesus, you said, take, eat, this is my body that is broken for you. Drink, this is my blood that is shed for you for the remission of sin. Holy Father, may the blessed grace of the Holy Spirit fall upon this moment. And what looks like mere bread and juice, may we receive the very body of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and his precious blood. And I plead the blood upon this church. I plead the blood upon this work. May the blood be upon us as it was upon the doors of the Israelites when the angel passed over. As your, as the, your people come forward sick, may they be healed as they receive your holy body and blood. May they be healed in the aisles as they approach. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you tonight. Our ushers will dismiss you row by row. Thank you so much. God bless you.
Sure. 
We believe that the nations will descend on this land. That the sick will be healed here. That the lost will be saved here. That the presence of the glory of God will rest here. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That the mountains might shake at your presence. That the gospel will go forth from here. Shaking the earth for the glory of God. That the presence of Jesus Christ would dwell among us. Here we will enter into the peace of your presence. Here we will remain. Jesus said, remain in me and I in you. Here we will remain. This is holy ground. Where only one thing is needed, Jesus. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped here. May his word be taught in clarity and love here. As we tell the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works he has done. May the generations come to find him here. To find Jesus here. Here. Together we will build the house of God. And a home for his people.